Welcome to the History of Comic Books. We're going to go back and learn step-by-step -step chronology of the modern comic book format. Let's relive the year 1933 and see how the world was living and how this helped shape the future of comic books. 1933 is a very important year for numerous reasons which we're going to discover. The year began with a historic creation of The Reign of the Superman in January 1933, a short story written by Jerry Siegel and illustrated by Joe Schuster in Cleveland, Ohio. He was the first published use by the writer-artist duo of the name Superman, which they later applied to their fictional superhero. The title character of this story is a telepathic villain rather than a physically powerful hero. Over the next five years, Siegel and Schuster would rework the character into the noble hero and eventually sell it to DC Comics in 1938. 1933 was the worst year of the Depression, with unemployment peaking at 25%, with one in four people unemployed in the United States. Many thousands traveled the railroads across the United States looking for employment. The continuing drought in the Midwest made even more of the land into dust bowls. The USA, now with a population of 125 million people, voted Franklin D. Roosevelt as their new president in March. Over in Europe, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany and opened the first concentration camp. Germany and Japan withdrew from the League of Nations. Esquire debuted as the first men's magazine. Lawrence Hammond introduced the Hammond organ. Alcatraz became a federal penitentiary. The Loch Ness Monster is spotted for the first time. Shirley Temple signs a movie contract with Fox when she's only five years old. The original smash King Kong hits theaters. And the first ever drive-in theaters are established in New Jersey. The chocolate chip cookie is invented, as is the popular board game Monopoly. Prohibition would end at the end of the year. Average wages at the time were $52 a week or $1,500 per year. A brand new house cost under $6,000. One gallon of gas was 10 cents, as was a can of Campbell's soup. Mickey Mouse was a hit sensation for Walt Disney and comic books had been on the market since 1930. David McKay published a four-issue annual series, and number three came out in 1933. It reprinted Mickey Mouse comic strips, measuring at 10 by 9 and 3 quarters, 52 pages long with a cardboard cover. This series would last four issues in total with later reprints. This was the common square uh, size that was very popular at that time. There were also two different Mickey Mouse magazines that debuted in 1933. The first in January published by Cayman Blair, distributed by dairies and local theaters, lasting until issue number nine. And the first few issues had a five cent cover price. The later ones did not. The second series was also giveaways done through different dairy companies. It had two volumes, both going 12 issues. Both magazines were done by Walt Disney Productions and they ended in 1935. In the summer of the same year, a new Mickey Mouse magazine was done by publisher KK Publishing, Aka Western Publishing Company. Like the previous incarnation, this magazine would run 12 issues, then restart back at number one with another volume. This continued for five years. Western also put one of those square sized comic books of Mickey Mouse out in 1933. 1933 gave us Detective Dan Secret Op 48, the first comic book sold on the newsstands with original material in it. Created by Norman Marsh, the comic had a three color cardboard cover inside, it was black and white, sold for 10 cents with dimensions 10 by 13, 36 pages and was only a one shot published by Humor Publishers Corp. The Detective Dan character was a Dick Tracy clone and didn't last very long. There was some other appearances by him though. One in The Adventures of Detective Ace King, also a one-shot from Humor Publishers that year. There are some minor differences between the two books. Among them a paper cover and pages sized 9.5 by 12. Humor Publishing also put out a third title that year called Bob Scully the Two-Fisted Hick Detective. It is believed that these became a big inspiration for Siegel and Schuster to revise their Superman character. 
comic books became a great marketing tool and due to the depression many publishers started printing comics that were free giveaways throughout the decade. This gave a chance for printing presses to keep running during these hard times. Thousands of different comics were given away as companies used popular comic strips for advertising purposes. The pioneers of this trend is given to Sam Gold and Kay Kamen. Among the most well-known giveaways are Kellogg's, Buck Rogers, and Ovaltine's Little Orphan Annie. Eastern Color Printing Company was one company that became very important in the formation of the comic industry. With 45-year-old sales manager named Harry Wildenberg, among his duties were to come up with ideas to keep the color presses going. In 1932, he noticed the color comic strip sections of newspapers were popular and thought they would be good for advertising. He suggested the idea of a comic book used for advertising to Gulf Oil Company, one of his clients. They liked the idea and hired a few artists to create Gulf Comic Weekly. Among them were Stan Shendel, who did The Uncovered Wagon. There was also Curly and the Kids and Smilage. These were one full page, full color comic pictures. The entire comic was four pages long and had a format of 10 and a half by 15 inches. The comic was given away at Gulf gas stations, making them probably the first comic book published and distributed outside of the newspaper market. The comic was advertised on radio, telling people to go to Gulf gas stations to get them, starting on April 30th, 1933. Much to everybody's surprise, the comics prove, proved a very effective draw to the gas stations. People were quickly coming in and snatching them all up. Gulf decided to print out 3 million copies a week and had the name changed to Comics Funnies Weekly. The series remained in tabloid size and lasted 422 issues, ending May 23, 1941. A few weeks after coming up with the tabloid size comic book, Wildenberg came up with the idea of doing a comic book. He said he got it when reading a tabloid sized comic strip page, folded it in half, then in half again. He noticed it was a convenient size for reading comics. He also thought publishing it with 32 or 64 pages would be a good size. Wildenberg wasn't the first to use this format though. From the 1880s to the 1910s, the size was popular for reprinted comic pages. Pulp dime novels were already using that size and the Ledger Syndicate was also using 7x9 format for their Sunday newspaper comic strip inserts. Convinced his idea would be popular, Wildenberg secured the rights from many major syndicates for to reprint their various comic strips, among them Associated Bell, Fisher, McNaught, and Public Ledger Syndicate. He had an artist make up a few handmade comics for demonstration purposes and then had his sales staff go around to all of Eastern Color's biggest advertisers. The first to respond, by telegram, was Procter & Gamble asking for a million 32 pages color comic book. The comic published in the spring of 1933 was called Funnies on Parade. Most remarkable about it was it set a format standard using the same 8x11 format that comics are still printed in today. All 1 million copies were given away in a few weeks. The comic came with coupons for Procter & Gamble products. Doing all this work paid off for Wildenberg. Most of his staff were infected by the comic publishing bug after this issue and went on to continue with comics afterwards. The sales staff included Max Gaines, partnered with DC to create All American Comics imprint and then started EC Comics. Lev Gleason became a publisher himself, best known for starting the crime comic genre with Crime Does Not Pay and Harold Moore. Also working on the project was Sol Harrison, the Color Separator, who became DC Comics president and retired in 1980. George Dougherty Sr. was the printer, created a live George Dougherty comic company. Morris Margolis was from Charlton Publications and was asked to help them figure out how to print the pages in order. <laughs> 